Hello everyone, uh, once again, this is Dr. Barnes and I'm going to walk you through the various stages uh, that the New Testament has gone through in order to uh, get to you as the NIV. Um, as you know, the New Testament is not written like the NIV. Uh, NIV is a translation and it's also an interpretation. And I'll demonstrate that to you uh, very easily. Here is one of the earliest texts of the Gospel of John. It's called P means papyrus. Bodmer is the guy who published it. P. Bodmer 66, that's page 66, and it's John 19 as we know it. This is what the New Testament um, looks like. Uh, as you can see, there is a lot of empty space here and we have to fill that in with other fragments, is what we call them. Little pieces like this right here. Uh, we have to put everything together. So this is what people like me look, look at whenever we are interpreting the New Testament. Now I want to show you something really cool about this particular fragment. Uh, we can do two birds with one stone, uh, so to speak, because there's something very special about this uh, document and it is right here you can see my my uh, mouse pointer that's called a starogram and it's interesting because it's taking up several letters of a particular word and that word is crucify and you can see it looks kinda like a cross and that's because that's what it is and it's what scholars did I mean, scribes did to show uh, that they were taking up more than one letter. And uh, that's just really cool. What they did was they did the first part of the word. It's staro. So this is an S and a T. And then this is the rest of the rest of the body of the word. And then this right here is the ending of the word. Like, uh, it's used as a participle, and it has the participle ending with on a symbol. So you have the symbol, and then like I-N-G. So uh, it's something that I think is very cool. So it's an early uh, scribal symbol that only Christians used, because obviously believe in the crucified Christ. I'm going to... I. Uh, went in a little bit closer and see this line here right above it it means that it, the scholar I keep saying scholar the scribe is indicating to us that there's something he did differently in this text that wasn't in the previous copy you know he's calling our attention to the fact that he knows he's using the symbol for the word crucify So you see the freedom that scholars had, scribes had, whenever they were uh, copying the text. They didn't have to, you know, the Holy Spirit wasn't making them uh, do everything exactly the same as the one before them. Now this is what the New Testament looks like, uh, all neat and uh, nice, but you see all this gibberish down here where it says 14 and all these symbols. Uh, this tells the scholar is called an apparatus. This tells me what all the little other little fragments that go right here, all the little fragments and variants, like for example, you have starogram here, but some other uh, some other scribes might have written out the word to crucify all the way, and this gives me the choice down here. So I can decide which reading which text I would rather translate or interpret. So whenever you get to the NIV, for example, it does not read exactly like the Greek reads here because they might have chosen different texts. There's 35,000 different texts and it's a matter of choice. And there are logical arguments for choosing one text over another. The first argument is the oldest manuscript, like this Papyrus 66 is the oldest manuscript that we have of John. 
Therefore, I would follow the older manuscript, and that would be, to me, the authoritative reading and what I would translate if I was a translator. Now, there is another interpretive method that is older. It's what the King James Version uses. It's called the majority text theory. And what that is, is a, it is a majority of the copies. Like, say for example, that we were an ancient church, like in 300 CE, and we had our own scribes that copied the New Testament. Well, if they copied and copied and copied and copied for generations, you will have a majority reading of a text. In other words, not all of the texts read exactly like this oldest text, but as uh, other people, and especially Christians in different geographical areas, as they started using and copying the same texts, it gains authority because everybody's doing it. And the scribe over in Alexandria knows that whenever he's copying a text, it matches his, and the scribe in Rome is copying the same text. So the, the geog geographical distance gives weight to the majority text theory. But that's not so much the, uh, the consensus among scholars right now is the um, oldest text is usually the um, most reliable. Now, there are a lot of other little things that you would have to know, uh, little arguments and, and tricks of logic that you need to know in order to put all this stuff together. But the oldest theory and the majority text theory are the ones that you need to know for, uh, you'll, you'll be seeing differences, big differences in translations. Like, for example, the, KG, the King James Version and the NIV. It's because they use a different textual theory. They understand how these 30,000 30, texts come together. You know, if you have more than one scholar, they're going to be arguing with each other about how all this stuff fits. And uh, Bruce Metzger, the author of your book, is one of the scholars who was key in producing what we're looking at right here. Instead of looking at this all the time, sorry about that, that's a little... Instead of looking at stuff like this all the time, we get to look at this, which is a nice, pretty Greek New Testament. Now, you'll see, as we're looking, these are accent marks, okay? It's, it tells you how to pronounce the language. These marks here are critical marks. That tells you that, well, if you were reading Greek, that would tell you that these two words here, uh, this is is, and this is os. Uh, so it would tell you that there are different readings of the text, and other texts would say different things than this reading right here. And so I wanted to show you, if you can see my mouse, see it's 15, go down 1, 2. This is the word that we that we were looking at, the starogram, that little cross symbol. And I was just telling you that it has an S, that's a Greek S, this is a Greek T, and you can see that's an A and a, and a, a U, upsilon and so forth. This is the ending of the word, and that's O-S-O, -O. and this part of the word, from the T to the R, right here, or the T to the P, is what it looks like in English, this was the symbol, and this is the ending of the participle, and this is the first letter of the word. So, uh, staroso. Very cool, and, it kept, and, and the scribe kept using that, if you go down one, two more down, you'll see the same word again, that S-T-A-U-P. Uh, that's still a, par that's a participle again, and, unless I'm wrong in, in, in its future. But uh, that means also to crucify. So, and then you have it down here on 16. Go down one, two, three, four, five. You have the 
E S T A U. And all and this right here that I'm circling with the mouse is uh, taken up by the symbol. I thought that was really cool that a symbol can be used as a, exactly as a bunch of letters within the root Greek word and then you have the participial ending or the verbal ending uh, that words usually have. So you go from this over here on the left to this and you have all this gibberish down here at the bottom. I'm going to talk about that for a second. Holy cow. I guess I have to just go like this. I'm sorry if that makes you seasick. But this is important. Okay. <laughs> now, there's 35,000 manuscripts and fragments of the Greek New Testament. And you look at one usually you know, one manuscript, which is the text of the NIV. Now, this right here, where it, ha it says 14, and all of that stuff tells me everything on the page, uh, where all of the fragments are. And if you look across 14, just stay with me, stay with me, look all the way across, and you see this weird looking thing, that's a P, 66, Papyri 66, which is what we looked at on the previous page. And if you look, and there's, an, there's another one, Papyrus uh, 66, and it tells me there are symbols up above, uh, above this on the page, sorry, above this on the page that tell me uh, what this means. Like this could be words left out, or words added, or maybe there's one word uh, out of order in the text, but uh, that's what all this gibberish does, and this is what I have to live with on a daily basis, and it's not, well, I mean, it's fun, but it's not fun. So, um, that's that, and that's how we get the longer and shorter ending of Mark. You know, there's differences, and all these, all these little texts have different things, but in the version, one of the versions that does not include the last versions of Mark, there are three empty pages. So it looks like the scribe got to that point at the end of Mark and for whatever reason st stopped copying and there are empty pages and then Luke begins. So it looks like uh, you know something was going on in the mind of that scribe uh, but uh, it's something that New Testament scholars are going to have to argue about from now to the end of time. But uh, you can see P66 shows up all over the place here because that's the earliest text. So it tells, it tells people, hey, the earliest text said thus and such, but we chose this different reading. And obviously uh, what you can do is at the beginning of, the, of this New Testament, you know, the Greek New Testament, it has a uh, legend and it shows you uh, what all the different symbols mean, like what this D and the L and the Delta and this funny looking symbol here. Uh, I'm, I'm on the second line. See my mouse? I'm going down a little bit. That th These letters and, and numbers uh, they all mean something. And if you ever want a PhD in the New Testament, you'll have to memorize all this stuff. Okay, and this is the pretty uh, NIV. And you see it's all nice and smooth, and somebody's figured out all the Greek grammar, grammar stuff for you, and they picked out all the uh, variants. And this is what it looked like beforehand. And this was the original. So that's how you get your New Testament. And I was going to uh, show you, uh, this is where we were a minute ago, uh, 19, and then where's 13? Okay, we can't really... Okay, here is your king, Pilate said. I can't really read what number I'm on. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! 
and the word crucify is signified in the earliest manuscript of John as cross. And that's not all, folks. Okay, we've seen that text a couple times. Uh, you all know and love love this text as Papyrus Bodmer number 66. This here is the last page of the codex that the Gospel of Thomas is in. And you can see it's covered in crosses. It's from Egypt, so there's an onk. And there's the PX that uh, is on the Pope's hat. And this is the Gospel of Thomas itself. And if you can see what I'm seeing on the screen, you can easily identify this beautiful little thing here. You see the crossbar here and the rest of the starogram in the Gospel of Thomas. Now this is a Gnostic document. Um, and we have to say Gnostic because we don't know who the Gnostics really were. Now, a lot of people have pretended to know that we really don't know what was going on back then. But we, we can tell that they're definitely in the Christian tradition. Nobody else used this symbol. Um, and I thought it was interesting that it's in the Gospel of Thomas. Now, we'll see it again. This is the end of the, the, end of the Codex. It's not actually the end of the Gospel of Thomas. Um, I previously thought that, but after I looked at it myself, I, I saw that it's the very, very last page uh, of the Codex itself. This is a different, end of a different uh, writing. Sorry about that. I just wanted to go back to this, and if you can follow my mouse, it's right here. There's the starogram in Crucify. And there's the starogram in the word Crucify. Again, it's taking up exactly the same letters. And let's read the passage. Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said, Whoever does not hate his father and mother cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not hate his brothers and sisters will and carry the cross as I do, will not be worthy of me. And that sounds very familiar to us here reading the Gospels right now. So I just wanted to show that to you. Um, I thought that was amazing. Um, I, I uh, received this information uh, the very first day of my PhD program, and uh, I hope you guys liked it. Um, I also wanted to show you uh, so, something else here. Sorry, I have to move it like this, but yeah, you see this up at the begin up at the beginning. Uh, this is an ancient scribal tradition, and you'll remember from the first lecture where it had the end of the Gospel of Luke, and it said Evangelion kata Lucan, and then there was a there was a space, and then it said Evangelion kata Johannin. Well, this is all Greek uh, uppercase, and it's kata, which means according to, and then Johannin, which is John. And in case you're wondering, uh, for those of you who, who are interested, uh, this is German on the other side. It's a German translation. So um, I had to learn German too. But this is the... i got to escape out of here real quick. I don't know... Take it. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm just gonna scroll up. This is the, another text of the Gospel of John, and you can see that a lot more is there than than Papyrus Bodmer. And I don't really, I don't know the history behind this particular picture, but it is it is Papyrus. And up at the top, this says Gospel, Evangelion, Katza, and then. Johannan is up here at the top of the page. It's an ancient scribal tradition that we uh, hold to today. So let me know if you have any questions. Uh, this is this lecture is more than anything is designed to uh, inform you more on the on the first 
uh, lecture and just show you uh, what happens behind music uh, whenever you read the New Testament. Thank you very much. Okay.